So you're there in Mark chapter 5, and what I'm going to be preaching on this morning, I thought about doing it tonight, but I didn't want to have you guys have nightmares. Um, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be preaching on possessed with devils, possessed with devils. And you say, well, Pastor Robinson, you know, why in the world is this relevant? Because it's still going on. Okay, and that's the one thing, if, if I get anything across, is that this isn't something that, that was just happening back in Jesus' day, or back in the Old Testament, and you say, well, it, you know, it's in the New Testament. Yeah, well, this was the Old Testament still, when this was going on. But what I'm going to show you is that it's still going on, and it'll still be going on until the end, until all the devils are cast into the lake of fire, into hell, and then the lake of fire. And so, but I first want to just talk about, the, so Mark, Mark 5 covers this, this, this famous passage with legion. Legion, where this, this man was possessed with many devils. Legion. And so we're going to get into that passage, but I first just want to talk about, you know, what, what, is, what does devil mean, you know? And I'm not against using the word demon or demonic or anything like that. It's just, you know, just a different way to say the same word. Um, but the Bible uses the word devils, okay? And it uses plural devils. So there's the devil, but then there's devils, okay? Well, I just want to kind of talk about what those words mean a little bit, like Satan and the devil, Okay, I believe that uh, when you're dealing with the word devil, you're dealing with the accuser, and Satan is like a word for uh, for an adversary. Okay, if you think about you know get thee behind me, Satan, he says that to Peter. Okay, why? Because the word means an adversary, and at the time you know Peter Peter saying this isn't going to happen to you, not going to happen to you, and you may wonder to yourself why did he say that to Peter? You know, was Peter wasn't Satan? Right? But just as much as devil doesn't necessarily talk about the devil all the time. Sometimes you're talking about many devils. And, but go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Because um, you're going to see this, uh, you know, a lot of times it talks about the devil or being our adversary. But he's also the accuser. Okay? And so 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Notice how the devil is your adversary. And so, um, I'm not going to go into the etymology of all these words right now, but what we can see is the Bible defines itself as far as when it's talking about the devil, who is he? He's your adversary. Okay? Go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And I love this passage, both in Revelation 12 and also in Revelation 20, where the devil's cast into the, to the, the bottomless pit, because it gives all his names. So if there's any doubt that the devil and Satan is the same person, or that the serpent and Satan is the same person, there's no doubt in this passage that when, when all these words that are used for this person is all the same person. Okay? And why would you use different words? Because there's different things to describe somebody. right? An accuser gives you a little more information than an adversary, right? An adversary, obviously an accuser is an adversary, right? You would say that, but, um, but you'd use different names to, you know, it's kind of like Jesus, you know, Jesus is the Word of God. His name is the Word of God. His name's also Jesus, which, why is his name Jesus? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. You know, why, why does God have different names? Because it's, it's describing different things about who God is, okay? So, uh, but in, in, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, notice this, that old serpent, so now you're going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into, into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now remember that, his angels were cast out with him. We're going to see that that's important, that it's not just the devil, but there's devils, okay? But notice in verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So who is the devil? He's the accuser of the brethren. He's our adversary, okay? And so when you go back to Job, when it says that Satan, you know, came up to the Lord... And what did he do? He accused Job. That's exactly what the devil does. And you know what? That's still going on until Daniel's 70th week, where the, the devil's cast out of heaven. So, you know, a lot of people have this idea that Satan's not, you know, he was cast out of heaven at the very beginning. Not yet. Okay? That's what, that's what kickstarts the end times. The devil's cast out of heaven, and he has but a short time. 
and then that short time is where he's trying to kill the whole earth and then he sends the Antichrist to go after just the Christians and so I'm not preaching on end times right now but that's what this is talking about right so I just want you to see that you know when we're talking about the devil the Satan we're talking about someone as our adversary and someone that's an accuser but all his angels are the same with that he's just the prince of them the prince of the devils right Beelzebub okay and so with, with Judas he was possessed by the devil and and so you know he had the devil inside of him. He had Beelzebub inside of him. So he had a special office, obviously, to betray Jesus. So the devil took that into his own hands, right? But a lot of people are possessed by devils, meaning the devil and his angels, right? Go to Revelation chapter 5 while you're there. You may say to yourself, well, how many devils are there? And that's a good question, you know. How many, you know, because we know uh, from Revelation uh, uh, 12... Actually, if you're in Revelation 12, switch back to Revelation 12 real quick and look at verse 4. Because I want you to see here, when it talks about he was cast out with his angels, and it says in verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and they cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So when we see that he drew the third part of the stars, what's that re reference to? His angels the devil and his angels. So a third part of the angels was, was, became devils. Does that make sense? They left their estate, their first estate, and they were cast down to the earth. Now, uh, that's, that's going to be important because I'm going to show you, what, you know, the minimum amount of devils that are out in the world right now. Revelation 5, Revelation 5 and verse 11. Revelation 5, verse 11. Now we're going to do some math, so don't get lost on me here. But, uh, <laughs> but Revelation 5, verse 11, it says, I beheld and, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them, now the number of what? The angels, the many angels, was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Okay, so this is, you know, after the devils have already become devils, okay? So what we see here is the remnant, the, the, those that are left after, after the, 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 the dragon drew the third part of them. Does that make sense? Now, that doesn't mean the devil can't go up into heaven, okay? But we're talking about people that are praising God before his throne. So this is going to give you the minimum that there are, because 10,000 times 10,000, what is that? 100 million. 100 million. Thousands of thousands, okay, that's at least 4 million. Because thousands, plural, would have to at least be 2,000. And if you have 2,000 times 2,000, you have 4 million. So what do you have? You have, a, you have a, 104 million angels at least, right? Because thousands could be more than that, right? But at least it's 2,000. So you have at least 104 million angels that are praising God before his throne what would that give you? That'd give you 52 million devils. So if you want to figure out what's the third, what's the third that fell, just take half of uh, 104. Now you get your third, okay? And so, uh, or if you had this and you wanted to figure out what's, you know, what was the full number, you just multiply by 1.5. Anyway, I'm not getting, I don't want to get into the weeds on the math, but here's the thing, it's 40, 52 million. Now, that's minimum because here's the thing, there's 200 million, there's an army of 200 million when the second woe, when that sixth trumpet sounds. If you remember, there was the four cherubims, right? There was the, the that were loosed out of the river Euphrates. And he said, I, I saw the number of the army, which was 200 million. I didn't say 200 million, but that's what the number came out to be, right? And so uh, it's 200 million is the number there. Now, if those are all angels, because that are that are coming then that shows you that the number is even higher but this is minimum this is minimum amount of devils 52 million that's a lot okay 52 million devils that are out in the world and so that's a lot it's something to think about and they're still here now in this passage in, in mark chapter 5 we're dealing with this man now in another passage it talks about two men and so don't let that get you off track because just, just as the Bible sometimes will focus on one person, it'd be kind of like if I said, I saw Dave Gandy yesterday. I saw Brother Dave yesterday at the Soul Winning Marathon. Would I be lying to say that? But what if I said, 
and, and, and then someone else I said I said I saw brother Dave I saw brother uh, brother Sean I saw brother uh, Eric I saw all these you know and I name up all these people would I be lying no and so that's what you see a lot of times when you look at the different Gospels is it'll you know they'll say there was this man that came out of the tombs and in another place they say well there's two men that came out of the tombs well they're not lying it's not like he said there was only one man right it's not like he said there was one man no man beside him right now that and then you would have a problem okay you'd have a little trying to figure out what in the world I was saying there so anyway in this passage we're just dealing with the one man he's focusing on this one guy right well in verse 1 there it says and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the city of the Gadarenes and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So first of all, what we see here is that when we're dealing with devils, okay, when you're looking in the Old Testament, New Testament, all that stuff, sometimes it's not, it doesn't always say devil. Just as much as the devil's not always called the devil. He's called Satan. He's called Beelzebub. He's called Beelzebub. He's called Belial. Like, there's different names and titles to, or just different ways to say the same name. And so, unclean spirit. If you see the, the unclean spirit or familiar spirit, right? You know, talking about uh, the woman that Saul met with a familiar spirit. So, unclean spirit, familiar spirit, evil spirit, those are all devils. Okay? And so, uh, so if you just Google, if you just uh, did a search on devils in your, in your Bible search engine, you're not going to find all the places that they're mentioned. Okay? And so, in this passage, though, he says that, that, he, uh, that a man with an unclean spirit, later on, it talks about how he cast out the de a devil. You know? So, we see that it's synonymous. It's just using different phrases to show you what they're talking about. Unclean meaning that it's not, uh, it's not an angel. Okay? We're not talking about uh, the angels that are in heaven coming down and possessing you. Okay? So, it, it says he comes out of the tombs. Well, you should already see a problem there. What in the world is he doing in the tombs? Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Notice what happens here in verse 7. It says, And cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, who's talking here? It's not the man. It's the devil. It's the devil. It's the unclean spirits, actually, we'll see here, too, that it's, that's who's talking. And what you see a lot of times with these devils is they knew who Jesus is. And a lot of times he's telling them to, to keep silence. And that's a whole other sermon for another day because he was a man of no reputation. And, his, and when they would make him known that he was the Son of God, he couldn't do any, he had to like leave because they would throng him or they would try to make him a king. And so he, was, he made himself of no reputation for a reason. Okay? It's not like he didn't want people to know because he didn't want people to believe or something like that a lot of times. It was just the fact that he couldn't do many works there and he just the press would... You know, encompass him. He couldn't do what he needed to do. But it says in verse eight, for he said unto him, "Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit." So why why did this this devil say, "What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not." Why did he say that? Because Jesus had come out of him. Notice what Jesus says to this unclean spirit, and he asked him, "What is thy name?" And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now, that's creepy. Now, you know, the, 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 ter the term Legion is a thing that you would use for armies. Right? You think of, like, I spe I specifically think of, like, Roman legions. Okay? And I looked up what they would say a legion was. It's around 5,000. Okay? But we can use the Bible here. Look at verse 13. Because he, he told these devils to go into the... The devils besought Jesus that they would go into swine. And in verse 13, we see how many there were. Because in verse 13, it says, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000. 
and were choked in the sea. Now think about that. Now we know the devils can possess more than, you know, more than one devil can be in one being. That means there's at least 2,000 of them that was in this man. 2,000. So when you think of Mary Magdalene that had seven devils, he had not, she had nothing on this guy, okay? Because he had around 2,000 devils inside him. Legion is what they named themselves. And, uh, you know, I, when I watched that, I don't know if you watched that Demon Possessed film that Steadfast put out. It's fantastic. Don't watch it at night. But uh, <laughs> there was this one woman. He, they had, uh, you know, they were showing this one woman that was uh, possessed. And, and obviously these people, the people that were trying to treat this woman were thinking she just had, like, mental issues. They weren't thinking de uh, devils, okay? Because they're, like, you know, talking to her and saying, you're not, you're not evil, you're not all this stuff. But this one woman, when she would go into this state of being possessed, she, she would call herself Enigma. She gave herself a name, like they give themselves names. So these, these devils gave themselves a title, Legion. And Jesus knew that they would give themselves titles. He says, what's your name? And, he, and they said, you know, my name is Legion, for we are many. And this woman that had enigma said, uh, when, when there's this video of she's like, they're holding her, they have her strapped down, okay, and to the bed or whatever, and she's like staring at this guy. And I mean, uh, I'm laughing because Taylor was telling me how she like couldn't sleep or had nightmares. Because it's really creepy, okay? This woman was like looking at this guy with this blank stare that you can only describe as being like a devil looking at you, right? This, this, uh, and reprobates have this look about them too. And actually the psychopath, you know, like uh, those that are in psych psychopathy talk about this, this stare, or this look that psychopaths have. Psychopaths and lunatics are, are different. I think they can both be possessed, okay? But this woman that called herself Enigma she was like staring at this because uh, she, was, she kept saying, I'm going to kill this body. I'm going to kill this body. I'm going to kill this body. Sound familiar? Doesn't that look exactly what, what, this, what was happening with this man? We'll see, we're going to see another place where the same thing, but, but basically cutting themselves. You know, they're always mutilating themselves because the devils hate you and want to kill you. Okay, they want to destroy your body. We'll see that in, in a lot of cases. This is the case where they're like tearing up your body and your body's getting torn up and all this stuff, right? And so uh, this enigma, she looks at this guy and says, we shall always be. We shall always be. And just kept repeating that to this guy. We shall always be. And you just think about these devils and how, you know, how evil how wicked they are and the, and the devil himself, I think they truly think that they're going to try to last forever. They're going to like overthrow God and like they're going to win this battle. And we saw in Revelation 12 that they don't win the battle. <laughs> okay, Michael and his archangels and the devil and his angels are cast out of heaven and you know thrown down to the earth. But we also see too that um, you know, we're going to get to that too as far as you know, when are they going to, when's that going to happen? I want to, I want to talk about that. But but we see different things. What are, what are the aspects or, you know, the signs of people being possessed? Okay. Now, we can obviously read through the Bible and see these different things. But go to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19. I've been out soul winning where I thought people were possessed. But I were. I have a story about my younger brother talking to a guy that was probably clearly possessed. And, uh, and many of you probably have run into people that you're just like, that guy was probably possessed or that woman was probably possessed. But go to verse 19. So Isaiah 8, verse 19. Isaiah 8, verse 19. It says, And when they, they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits. Remember, what is that? They're devils. And unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not uh, people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? So what does the Bible talk about? People that have familiar spirits, what do they do? They peep and they mutter. Go to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29 and verse 4. Isaiah 29 and verse 4. 
Isaiah 29, verse 4. Now, obviously, in the New Testament, we have a lot of different things that they do to, to kind of know, hey, this person's probably possessed with a devil. But in the Old Testament, we see some other things, too. That they, they peep and they mutter. Notice in verse 4 of, of Isaiah 29, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. So what do these people do? They whisper, they, they meep, or they peep and they mutter. You know what this makes me think of? The Pentecostal movement. The Pentecostal movement that say they speak in tongues. And when they say that, they're not talking about where they speak a language that people can understand. And they speak in many tongues or, or whatever. No, they're talking about some made-up demonic language. Okay? Now, some people in this movement are just making it up. And they'll, they'll tell you, you know, when I was in this movement, when I was in the Pentecostal uh, Holy Roller movement, you know, you just got to fake it. Some people aren't in the driver's seat, though. Some people have talked about it. They're like, yeah, I was blacked out. I didn't even know what happened to me. Next thing I knew, I woke up. I was on the floor, and there was a blanket over me or something like that. You know, you get slain in the spirit or whatever. But what's the Bible say about people that peep and mutter and whisper? You know, might as well put bark like a dog and foam at the mouth because that's what these people do in these Pentecostal churches. It's not biblical and it's of the devil. Amen. It's demon possession. They're possessed with devils. You know, and the, these, uh, you know, I think it's Trinity uh, Assemblies of God. All these Assemblies of God and these Pentecostals, the Apostolics, all these holy rollers that are, that are tongue talkers. A lot of them are demon possessed. Right. A lot of them have a bunch of devils and maybe legion, and, and probably the, the, the pastors of these churches are probably have the legion inside of them. Amen. And so, what does the Bible teach about it, though? Are we supposed to be up here and peep and mutter and whisper and, and say some like garb, gobbledygook where it, you can't understand what I'm saying? It, it, the Bible says you use words that are easy to be understood. Right. And if you speak in an unknown tongue, like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, that's talking about a different language. Brother Sean, you speak Spanish, right? If Brother Sean came up here and started speaking Spanish, how many people would understand what he's saying? One, one person, right? A couple people. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I figure your family would know, right? Um, but here's the thing. I may be able to pick up a couple things, but that's an unknown tongue that would be in the church. Does that make sense? Unless you have an interpreter. So this whole idea of all oh, the unknown tongue, you know, that's a bunch of gibberish, you know, that's a bunch of like, uh, you know, foaming their mouth, barking like a dog, making laps around the church, falling into baptistries. Peeping and muttering is a bunch of demonic possession. And you say, well, the, you know, we, we don't really see people possessed with the devil. Go down to the apostolic church. Go down to the, the assemblies of God. Go down to the Holy Roller Church. Go down to the church where this guy got bit by a rattlesnake and had to go to the hospital. <laughs> okay? Morons. Morons. I have no sympathy for people like that. I'm, just, I'm sorry. You know, I want, I want people to get saved, but people that are that stupid to hold up a bunch of poisonous snakes and just, you know, let them bite them and all this other stuff, you know, it's kind of like, you, you know, you get what you reap what you sow, okay? But I want you to see, you know, well, there's one place that you can look at. You want to go find some devil possessed people? I remember going to uh, Horizons Church one time. It's down in Lost Creek. And uh, I forget why I was there. But anyway, I remember Kent Hovind like did a, a, a seminar there before he went to jail, and that was the first time I met Kent Hovind. Um, not that he was for that church, but he was just kind of meeting there or whatever. And I forget this was a long time ago. I think I was in college, and I went to one of their services, and they were all there was like people up there like you know speaking in tongues and and like doing all this weird language like weird stuff, right? And I'm just like I'm just like this is weird. Just this is really crazy. Okay. And anybody that's saved that goes in there is just going to be like, this is really messed up. This is really messed up. There's nothing spiritual about this. Okay? This is just messed up, demonic possession. And so the Bible condemns that. Now go to Mark chapter 5 again, because we're going to see some other attributes. So if you see people speaking with tongues, and you know someone that speaks with tongues, unless they're faking it, they're possessed with the devil. That's what I believe. That's right. Unless they're faking it, they're possessed with the devil. 
That's what I would tell them too. You know, I mean, here's the thing. Obviously, we need to give them the gospel, and I'm not saying to like start off with that. You know, you'll be like, well, I'm a tongue talker. You'll be like, well, let me tell you why you're possessed with the devil. Now, I'm not saying to start off that way, okay? Obviously, you start off with the gospel. But if it really comes up, and that's something they just keep pushing at you, pushing at you, pushing at you, just be like, listen, the Bible says that we're not supposed to peep and mutter, and that sign of peeping and muttering is being filled with familiar spirits, being filled with the devil. And so these experiences that people have, these experiences of, of you know, the so-called Spirit of God, right? And they'll say, well, Baptist churches are dead because they don't have the Spirit of God on them like we do because we're not running around like lunatics. We're not running around by crazy people, running around in laughs, jumping into the baptistry. You look like a psycho. The, the Bible's very clear that, yeah, we're supposed to be beside ourselves for the Lord. Yeah, you know what? Going up to Pittsburgh and spending a whole day of our free time going out to preach the gospel to a bunch of people that will probably never come to our church, that looks crazy to people. But that's preaching the gospel and getting people out of hell. Amen. Amen. We're not just up here. I'm not up here just to make a fool of myself and start like saying a bunch of gibberish and then you like slay me in the spirit. I lay on the ground with a blanket over top of me. That's a bunch of devil worship. That's a bunch of demonic, and that's, it, all that goes down to is people don't have faith, and they have to have something that's tangible. That's right. And this demonic possession of speaking with tongues, of having some experience that you have, all that is is showing me I need something that I can see and feel and touch, and faith is not enough. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. And so we need to get off this whole, I need, I need everything that I can see. I need the nice building. I need, I need to see everything that's going on. No, listen, you need, to, you need to walk by faith, not by sight. And these people that, that have this movement of all these emotions and all these, these, these uh, you know, things of the Spirit, so to speak, I'll put that in quotations. You know what's of the Spirit? Open your mouth boldly and make it known the mystery of the Gospel. Being filled with the Spirit is coupled with being filled with the Word of Christ. And you know what? If you're quoting me the Bible, hey, you're filled with the Spirit. You know what? If you're preaching the Gospel and you're giving people the Gospel, faith comes by hearing and by the Word of God. You're preaching them the Gospel, giving them the Word of God. Hey, you have the Holy Ghost inside of you. You're filled with the, the, the power of the Holy Ghost. But this whole idea of just like, you know, uh, I got the Holy Ghost over, over me right now and I, I can't move and... And it's a bunch of garbage. It's a bunch of demonic possession. They're possessed with devils. And I'm not afraid to say it. You know, some people say, well, you know, maybe they're just, you know, crazy or something like that. Listen, do you think that, do you think the devil doesn't want to be, he, he wants to make Christianity look stupid. Like that guy that got bit by a snake. People are looking at me like, I don't want to be a Christian. I saw comments where people say, no religion for me. They be, it makes Christianity look stupid because they actually think that that's what the Bible teaches. It's like the flat earth stupidity. It's like the tongue talking stupidity. It's a bunch of vain janglings, a bunch of false doctrines that people ascribe to the Bible because there's a bunch of people that claim to be Christians that say they want that that's a part of that. That's right. So I'll call it out for what it is. It's devil possession. But Mark chapter 5 verse 3, Mark chapter 5 verse 3, Notice the attributes of this man, the maniac of Gadara, I guess is what people call him. That's not in the Bible, but that's what people call this guy, right? That's like the, the, uh, the theologian term, right? <laughs> or something like that. We're going to get into eschatology and the exegesis of the maniac of Gadara. Anyway, so Matthew, or Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, and verse 3. Um, it says, uh, it says, who had his dwelling among the tombs? So you ever see people that, uh, that are really into like being in graveyards? I mean, who here wants to go to a graveyard and just hang out? Listen, I don't like being in a graveyard because it reminds me of people that have gone, you know, that have passed away, right? And, you know, that loved ones that have passed away. I'm not afraid of a graveyard, okay? It's not like I'm afraid to go in there. Like these people are going to come out like the living dead or something like that. 
Listen, The Walking Dead is a farce, okay? The, the zombie apocalypse, Sam Gipp. Is it Sam Gipp or Bill Grady? I can't remember. Those, those two are so crazy. They merge together. I mean, talk about oneness. I mean, Bill Grady, Sam Gipp, Keith Gomez. I mean, that's oneness right there. Anyway, you know, <laughs> the being at the tomb, being in a, in a graveyard, I mean, that's not my Sunday afternoon I want to spend, okay? Hey, let's all have a picnic. Let's go down to the, the, great, the local graveyard. We'll, we'll go down there. We'll go look at the tombs and all this stuff. Listen, I'm not against going to the graveyard and putting flowers on your, your loved one's grave and kind of just with your family members, remembering them and, and all that stuff. That's fine. I'm not against that, okay? But that's not a place I like to hang out. It's not like, we're going to the graveyard today. Yes. You know, I'm excited. So this guy's dwelling among the tombs. So there's a f first red flag if, as far as, um, hey, if someone likes to be in the graveyard and likes death, then you need to worry about whether they're possessed with the devil. In verse 4 it says, because, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in verse 3 it says, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that... He had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. So what do we see also? We see supernatural strength. Supernatural strength. I've seen videos of a woman where there's like five guys trying to hold this woman down who's clearly possessed. I mean, you look at this person, you would literally think that the night of the living dead was happening. Like, I don't know if you've seen these videos where these people are, you know, they got into these drugs or something like that. And here, here's the thing. You get into drugs and stuff like that, the devils are going to be coming in with that. Yeah, that's right. I do believe there's a correlation with people doing a bunch of weird drugs and devils just taking advantage of that. But these people, like, eat each other. I mean, not to be super graphic. I, now, here's the thing. I just want you to know what you're dealing with when you're dealing with devils and you're dealing with the, the world out here as far as what can happen. Because I saw these videos where these people are just like, I mean, they'll have broken limbs. They'll have like, you know, you, like you can see their, flat, like their, their, their muscles, they're just so maimed, but they're still going. Why? Because there's a devil inside of them that's keeping them going, and they, the devil wants them to die. I mean, you look at this, and you're just like, this is nuts. This is nuts. This has to be, a, this has to be made up. But it's not. And so these people have supernatural strength. That's why they had to tie them down to the bed. You know, like even that woman, they had her tied down to the bed. And she's like, she, you know, saying she's enigma and that she'll always be. And just repeating that and having that blank stare in your face because they're a devil. They're a bunch of devils that are possessing them. And notice in verse 5, it says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. So you see their self-mutilation. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all this other stuff. And, you know, that, that's like the, I don't know, it's not a new phase, but there's a lot of people that cut themselves. I don't know if they call them cutters. Okay? I'm not saying that every single person that cuts themselves is, is devil-possessed. But that's an attribute. So uh, if, if you see someone that, that cuts themselves and all this stuff, you may wonder. And you, and you say, well, is this, is this real? Does this really happen? Did it happened in Jesus' day. Do you believe the Bible? I'm reading you a story in the Bible. This is the narrator speaking. This is the Bible. This is the Word of God saying this happened. Listen, I had a story. I was with uh, brother, brother Greg uh, Vanderpool. He was down at Temple Baptist in Jacksonville, North Carolina. This was years ago. I think probably 2008 or 2009. He drove in to go soul winning with us. We were kind of having a marathon. And we were up in Uniontown, PA. And first door we knock. Never been out soul winning. And he's just coming with me, trying to learn how to go. First door we knock, it's a teenage girl. And I asked her if she knew 100% sure she was going to have. She's like, no, I'm going to hell, and, I'm, and, and I want to go there. I'm like, oh, oh all right, what in the world? And, she's, and she tries to explain to me. She's like, well, I have, the, you know, I have a Ouija board, and you know, I, I'm in contact with you know, like devils and stuff like that. And you know what they told her? They said, they said to her, you know, God is not real, and we, we want you to be here with us. And so, like, they were saying, you know, it's fun, it's not bad, everybody says that it's bad, all this stuff, and, like, you want to go to hell. Okay? That's what this Ouija board was saying. 
And so, uh, so you, th you think that was fake? Do you think she's just making that stuff up? Well, here's, wh here's what I did. I showed her hell in the Bible. I showed her where there's going to be rest day nor night, and all those devils will be burning harder than anybody else. Yeah. I said, no one's having a good time down there. I showed her Luke 16. I said, that guy in hell wanted to tell all his brothers about hell because he didn't want to go there. You know what? She, she got scared, and she got saved. Amen. But you think that that doesn't happen in other places? You think that's the only one place right there? And I just happen to be the one guy that ran into somebody that had that experience? So stay away from Ouija boards. Listen, it's not the board. It's not like the people over there at, what is it, Bandai or Brandi or whatever that company is that makes that thing. It's not like they're in there with like their, their wizard hats on making these things, okay? <laughs> you know, it's just a board with like a little thing on there. But when you invoke the devil with whatever you're doing, I don't care if you get candles from Kirkland's, right? I don't know. Is that where you get candles at? <laughs> anyway, get a Yankee candle that smells nice. I don't care if you get one of those candles and you invoke the devil, you're bringing the devil into your home. Right. Now, what we see here is that, hey, there's some attributes. But go to Mar Matthew chapter 17. Yeah. Matthew 17 I believe that a lot of people that are crazy and lunatic are possessed. Now, does that mean that everybody that, I mean, because I'm not talking about people that had dementia, I'm not people that have Alzheimer's, okay? I'm talking about people that, because there's obviously things where your mind just, you know, you're, you're degrading, right? Your mind just kind of goes and all this stuff. But people that are nuts, crazy, do you know a lot of times it's probably because they're possessed? And so, uh, in Matthew chapter 17, we're going to see that. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14, it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic. Now, who here has said that about their son? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it says, and sore, and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. So we see, first of all, with this guy who's, who's a lunatic, he's, his father is saying that about him, saying he's, he's lunatic. Notice how he's falling into the fire, into the water. So what, what's going on? He's like trying to kill himself, pretty much. Trying to mutilate himself. And then so verse 16, it says, And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So what was going on? Was he just crazy? Or did he have a devil inside of him? Now, if you, if you read other passages with the same account, it talks about how that devil tore him, and he laid there like he was dead, and they thought the child was dead. But... Obviously, Jesus is the Son of God, and he can take, you know, even if he would have died, he could have raised him from the dead, but, but he didn't die, and this devil came out of him, okay? So, I, I believe a lot of lunatic people are possessed with devils. You see these crazy people that are just off the wall and all this stuff, they're, they're probably possessed with the devil, and maybe many devils, okay? And so, it's kind of like depression, right? Most of the time, depression is not a chemical imbalance, you know, you have this whole idea in the world that, like, hey, we need to fix everything with a pill. Listen, most people that are depressed, it has nothing to do with a chemical imbalance in their, in their brain or in their body. Amen. It has to do with the fact that, first of all, they need to get saved. That's right. But they need to have the joy of the Lord in their heart. They need to have the Bible. Okay? And here's the thing. I know that people have heaviness. That's what the Bible uses for the word depression. Okay? But, you know, and there's a time to mourn. But we are not to be depressed people. And, you know, just as much as that, I believe, you know, when it comes to, to lunatics, yeah, there may be some cases where someone just has a chemical imbalance in their brain and they're just kind of off the wall crazy, right? But I think just as much as in depression, most of those cases aren't that. I think most of the cases of being people that are lunatic are not a chemical imbalance, but actually being possessed with the devil, okay? Does that mean every case is going to be like this where, he, where he gets, they get healed? Well, in this case, his disciples couldn't do it. So obviously it was a hard case. It was a hard case to get that devil out with someone that was a lunatic. It takes prayer and fasting. 
right? So uh, it's not like an easy case where you're just preaching the gospel and they may get saved or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's just something to think about there. Now, what about the devils? Are they still around today? That's what I wanted to get to because we're seeing all this in the Bible and you say, well, you know, that's crazy, you know, but that was back in Jesus' day. You know, he rose again from the dead. All the devils are gone. That's what people think. Well, I'm going to show you a place where people try to say that, okay? We'll go to 2 Peter chapter 2. But, I'm also, but then I'm going to show you places in the Bible where after the resurrection, there's devils, there's unclean spirits, even all the way till you get the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all that. Okay? And so, just as much as the devil's still around and walking about seeking whom he may devour, those devils are there with them. Better doing the same thing. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, and verse 4, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. And it goes on, it's talking about, you know, also the, the flooding of the earth and all that stuff. This is where people say, well, in this passage it says they're cast down to hell, and they were delivered so the, into chains of darkness. So they say, well, that's past tense. Well, uh, what you have to understand is that a lot of times in the Bible, when you're especially when you're dealing with future stuff, it can either be in past, present, or future tense. I'm going to show you some passages on that to, sh to prove that to you. But in Matthew chapter eight, Matthew chapter eight, dealing with uh, the same story. Now, that, remember I, what I was saying in Matthew eight, uh, in verse twenty-eight. Go to uh, uh, Matthew eight, verse twenty-eight. Remember how I was telling you, like in one story it talks about two people, and in the other story it talks about one, so that's why you'll see it's dealing with two people here. But in Matthew 28, or Matthew 8, verse 28, it says, And when he was come to the other side into the, the, the country of the uh, Gergesenes, there met, with, met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Notice this. Art thou come hither to, to, uh, to torment us before the time? Okay, so these devils were cast out. You know, obviously they drew the third part, and they're down here doing their thing, right? And, and he's saying to Jesus, you know, like, have you come to torment us before the time? They know that their damnation lingereth not and slumbereth not, right? And so, but also Luke, Luke 10. So I want to show you the passages, you know, where people will say, well, uh, you know, they are already delivered into chains. So all the devils are already in hell, okay? Well, Luke 10 explained this one to me. Luke 10, because this is before Judas went to betray him, so the devil entered into Judas. Notice what Jesus says in, in Luke 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, had Satan fallen from heaven yet? That doesn't happen until Revelation chapter 12. And obviously Satan was still around after he said this, right? And so what we see here is that a lot of times the Bible use a future, basically, when, 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 the, when, when, when they say like past tense, know that that can't be changed. Does that make sense? Like when it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen before it is fallen, you know what that means? It's as if it's already done. You know, there's a lot of things that God, you know, will kind of give you a caveat, like, the, uh, like Nineveh where he preached to him saying, I'm going to destroy this city in 40 days. And then he repented from it. But if he said, Nineveh is destroyed, there's no changing it. Does that make sense? So when it uses past tense like that, you know what that means? Is that there's no changing it. There's no way for them to, to not get this judgment. Now I'm going to show you some places. You go to Psalm 22. I'm going to show you places about Jesus' prophecy. So there's no doubt that what we're talking about here is something that was going to happen in the future when this was written. But it'll use past tense, it'll use present tense, and it'll use for, uh, future tense. So, but I believe a lot of times why, why it uses past tense when it hasn't happened yet, or even present tense, because listen, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. It was done. You know, he hadn't done it yet, but you might as well just write it in the book. It's going to happen. He's God. He's going, he's going to do it. So even though it hadn't happened yet, it was written as if it had already been done. He's speaking of those things as be not as though they were. Right. So in Psalm 22 and verse 16, 
It says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Notice past tense. Now whose hands and feet were pierced? Jesus. And that didn't happen until later on. This is David writing this psalm. Go to Isaiah 53. So if you know, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53 are the two most famous passages in the Old Testament dealing with what Jesus was going to do as far as dying on the cross, taking our sins upon him. Right? And we're not going to go through all of Isaiah 53, but if you did, you'd see past, present, future all the way through it. And it just switches between those. And so that's why. It, 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 it's showing you that, hey, there was no doubt this was going to happen. When it says it in past tense like that, you, it's happening. It's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. He's not going to repent from it. And even in Hosea, it even says that. I believe in Hosea chapter 14, or chapter 13, it says that repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. When he talks about death, I will be thy plagues. You know, and so, uh, but in, in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men. That was present tense. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And you'll see later on, it says, when he shall see the, the travail of his soul, he shall be satisfied. Right? Talking about Jesus' soul being in hell. And so, he knows how it does the future as well. When he shall see this, you know, he'll be satisfied. But it's past, present, and future. So how do you answer that in Second Peter? Well, it's just the fact that, you know, it, just, it hasn't happened yet, but note this, it's going to happen. Nothing's going to change that. There's no redemption for the angels that fell. They're going to be cast into hell and reserved unto, uh, unto judgment. Now, you say, well, what's that talking about? Well, we, are, we know, and, and I don't have this written in my notes, but in Revelation chapter 20, what happens to the devil? Well, Apollyon, or Abaddon, whatever you want to call him, uh, he takes a big chain, binds the devil, and casts him, what? Into the bottomless pit, which is hell, which is Isaiah 14, come to pass. So what's happening at the same time? All the angels are be ba being bound with chains, being reserved unto judgment. Because what's going to happen to the devil and his angels? So when the devil gets, gets chained up and put into hell, guess what? His angels are being chained up and put into hell. When, he gets, when the devil gets cast into the lake of fire, guess what? His angels are being cast into the lake of fire. Amen. That's what's going on there. Now, uh, the, the, the past, I'm going to show you passages proving that there's devils and stuff like after the resurrection. Okay, go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 16. So I'm going to show you these passages, and then I'm going to show you how you deal with it. Right? What can we do? You know, are, we, are we helpless to, to people that are possessed with devils? Well, no, we're not. We have the Holy Ghost inside of us. We have the Word of God, and I'm going to show you what the Bible teaches on that. And so... Obviously, the apostles, what you, what you see, too, is the apostles had a lot of, uh, it talks about signs and wonders of the apostles. And really what it comes down to is the apostles had more of a, uh, an abundant power because they were, you got to look at it, they're kick-starting the New Testament. And so they're doing a lot of these signs, and it's all very encompassed into, so they're like healing people from the dead. You know, Paul had handkerchiefs that, you know, they would just like get healed if they had these handkerchiefs and stuff like that. Those are signs of the apostles. All the apostles are gone. Okay, but that doesn't mean that like you can't that these miracles still can't happen. You know, as far as you know, casting out devils and doing all this other stuff. But it's not it's not it's not like where the legion you know where Jesus cast them out and then you see this herd of swine running down the bank and getting choked into the waters. Now if that happens, I'm not saying it didn't happen. Okay, but uh, but you got to understand that that was uh, you know with the apostles, God was using a lot of these signs and wonders to kind of kickstart that New Testament. And so, but in uh, in Acts chapter five and verse sixteen it says, and there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk. And them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. So here's after the res resurrection, that they're bringing people to them that are vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. 
Acts chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and they were lame and were healed. So we see, you know, that's very clear, okay, that, this, that these unclean spirits, they were possessing them, okay, and they were cast out. Go to Acts chapter 19. And this is a very interesting story here in Acts chapter 19, dealing with Paul and, and, and uh, the, these sons of uh, Sceva, okay? Because, you know, these people that are exorcists, like the Catholic ex exorcists and, uh, you know, these, these Pentecostals that think that they're casting out devils, you know, that's why they're all possessed with devils, okay? Because this story right here of people that aren't saved trying to cast out devils, I'll show you how dangerous this is, okay? Now, as saved people, we had the power of God on us to where we can cast out devils. We're not worried about being possessed with devils. I'll get to that in a minute. So for those that are worried about this, be like, oh, man, I, that's scary stuff. Listen, if, if you have the Holy Ghost inside and you're saved, there's nothing, you don't have to worry about being possessed with the devil, okay? But in, in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, it says, and, wrought, uh, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Notice that special miracles, Okay, so that's what you have to understand, you know, like these Pentecostals are just like, oh, you know, Paul did this, we should be able to do this. He was an apostle, and God did some special things with him, okay? But in, in verse 12 it says, so that from his body were brought unto, uh, brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the, the disease de departed from them, the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So notice how, you know, evil spirits, familiar spirits, unclean spirits, right? Notice in verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. So what's going on here, first of all, before we see the end of the story? We have a bunch of vagabond Jews, people that aren't saved. They're exorcists, right? This is probably how they make money. And, and let, me, let me tell you something. These Pentecostals, these TV preachers, the, these, these Catholics, they're all about filthy lucre. And they're doing all this, and they're making this big show, and, and they get these actors up there on, their, on their, uh, their platform to make it look like it's all real. It's all to make money. Put your hand on the screen, give us $10,000, we'll send you a blessing, right? And so it's all to make money, and that's what these people wanted to do. That's right. But, so they were exorcists, so to speak, and they say... We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. Notice how they're not really owning it. They're just like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to adjure you by that, what, what Paul was saying over there, right? Notice what happens here. In verse, uh, in verse uh, 14, it says, And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the, the priests, which, uh, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So we see also, you know, the cutting and all that stuff. So these, these devils are just kind of tearing them apart, right? But notice that. That's interesting. That if you're saved, the devils know you. They know who you are. But they also know they can't mess with you. Now, that's not to pick a fight with them, okay? Because we're not supposed to speak evil of those things which we know not, right? We're not supposed to, even Michael the archangel said, the Lord rebuke thee to the devil, okay? So I'm not up here like saying, hey, come on, devil, let's go. Okay, I'm going to say the Lord rebuke thee. But, uh, but we see that they invoked Jesus, but they weren't saved themselves, and they ended up getting possessed. And they ran out of there naked and wounded, Okay? And so, uh, that's what's going on in these churches. They're like, oh, out of the, the name of Jesus, you know, devil come out of him. And then, then they're like these demon-possessed people. You know, because if there was a devil in that person, it's probably going to leap on him. You know, Jesus we know, but who are you? Who are you people? And so, uh, we need to remember that as far as uh, just seeing what, you know, say, well, all these leaders of churches are possessed. Yeah, probably a lot of them. Especially the reprobate ones, right? But uh, 
But uh, go to First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four and verse one. There it says, "Now the Spirit ex- speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils." So there's seducing spirits that are still out there. And you think about the, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, you think about uh, there, there's devils that are still in the high, higher ups that are, that are trying to run things, right? Uh, Revelation 16, this is the last thing I'll show you as far as just examples, but I just want to see, show you that this goes all the way to the end. So Revelation 16, Reve- Revelation 16 down there in verse 13. Revelation 16, verse 13, it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of all the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the, that great day of God Almighty. So tell me again that the devils aren't roaming around the world, because it's going on to the very end of the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 18, verse 2, you don't have to turn there, but Revelation 18, verse 2, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Okay? So even after Babylon falls, devils are inhabiting that place. Okay? And so that's why I believe they're going to be cast into hell, just the same time the devil is. And then you're going to have a thousand-year reign where the devil and his angels are nowhere to be found. But then the devil's going to be loosed. And I, I'm not positive, I'm not 100% sure whether the, the devils will be loosed too with them. You know, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say it. So I'm not going to say like dogmatically. But either way, they're going to all be cast to like a fire after that. So, uh, but, but what, what can we do about this, right? Well, uh, go to Jude and verse 9. Jude and verse 9. So right before Revelation there, Jude. You say, well, man, that's creepy. You know, you say, well, man, I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight thinking about the, the, the Legion and the Enigma and all these different, you know, like things that are going on in the world and these tongue talkers that are all filled with a bunch of evil spirits. Listen, we're not to fear those type of things. Man. But go to, go to verse 9 there. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So we need to remember that, hey, you know, the devil obviously is more powerful than us. You know, we're made a little lower than the angels. Now, that's not always going to be the case, right? Because, you know, we're going to be in our resurrection state. We're going to be we're going to be judging angels, right? But for right now, we're lower than them when it comes to power and all that. So we're invoking God. We're invoking Christ when it comes to these issues. OK, if, the, if there's someone was possessed with the devil, I'm invoking Jesus. I'm, I want Jesus to take care of this, this, this problem. I'm not saying in the power of me as a Christian, you know, I'm taking, I'm going to take this, this devil on, okay? And so Michael the archangel invokes God. He's the archangel that's fighting this battle, and he's invoking God. Go to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. This is interesting, too. Also shows the, the Trinity here. Um, but Zechariah 3... Zechariah 3 and verse 1, it says, And he showed me, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So his adversary is right there, Satan. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Notice that the Lord is saying, the Lord rebuke thee. <laughs> okay? That's interesting, right? But you think about Jesus says, come out of them. What, what was he using? The Holy Ghost. You know, the Lord rebuke, you know, the Lord is saying, the Lord rebuke thee. <laughs> you know? And so you can see the Trinity in there and how he, he's invoking the Holy Ghost. You know, and it's talking about, they said it was the devil. They said it was, he casted out devils by what? Beelzebub. But who did he really cast him out by? The Holy Ghost. Because they said that he had a devil, and that's why they had the unforgiveness, the, the, 
the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin, as you'd call it, right? And so we need to remember that we need to invoke God. Now, in just a practical manner, you know, like what do you do? If, somebody, if you ran up to somebody and they were uh, possessed with it, you just like they're, you can just kind of tell this guy's off, you know, you just tell this guy's probably possessed, right? It's just all the signs you see, he's, he's peeping, he's muttering, he's doing all these different things, his eyes are rolling back into his head. Well, first of all, ladies, just get away from that person. <laughs> Men, if you want to, if you want to try, you know, like, uh, you know, then what, what I would suggest to you is using the Word of God. Notice in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. So notice how Jesus cast them out with his word. So the word of God, what you're holding right here, is the power to cast out devils. And so that's what you need to use. And a story that I have, you know, my, my younger brother, we were out in Maryland. And we were soldering with Doug Saunders out there in Maryland, Frederick, Maryland. Or he's either Frederick or Hagerstown. I always get those two mixed up as far as where I'm at and when I'm out there. Anyway, we were out there soul winning, and this guy, we were just out in this, like, kind of, a, it was kind of an apartment complex, I guess. And this guy, like, Justin was telling me about it. He just, like, came up to me. He's like, oh, hey, you know, and, like, kind of came up to him. You know, it's kind of like this guy coming out of the tombs, you know, coming up to Jesus. But this guy came up because he obviously saw that we were Christians and what we were doing, you know. Uh, but he came up, and he was just, like, talking about, you know, speaking in tongues and all this stuff. And he, his eyes started rolling back in his head. And he started, like, kind of whispering and doing all this weird stuff. And so Justin just, like, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And he was just quoting off all these verses, and that guy's eyes came back, and like came back to his right state of mind. And the guy didn't get saved, but if you, if you want to know what to do in that situation, quote him the Bible. Because at, at the very least, the devils don't want to hear it. Man. Okay, so you want to if you want if you want to get rid of that 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 spirit or whatever. And and by the way, the Mormons had that burning in their bosom. Yeah, you know that's a real burning, probably the devil. But what do you do with that? Quote them the Bible. Yeah. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what you need. Amen. The sword of the spirit. If you're going to fight a spirit, what do you need? You need a weapon that's a spiritual weapon. Okay? And so, uh, that's what I would recommend to you. Okay? Now, to tone it down a little bit here, this is very few and far between, okay? It's not like I run into people I'm just like, man, they're just even possessed people all around me. They're just like, I mean, they're crawling up the mountains, you know what I mean? Like, like it's apocalypse time, you know? <laughs> like, they're just everywhere. Listen, just as much as the reprobates are a minority, and they want, to, they want you to make you think that it's like the majority of people out there, but it is the minority. The same thing with people that are possessed with devils. I don't think it's, it's I mean, if you think about it, there's 52 million. I mean, there's 7 to 8 billion people in the world. So they're not omnipresent, okay? So they can only go out so much. But, but they do dwell around where death's at. They dwell in like areas where it's like tombs and stuff like that. So trying to stay away from the places. But I want to end with this, that it's impossible for a Christian to be possessed with the devil. It's impossible. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. So if you're saved, you don't have to worry about being possessed with the devil. Okay? So that's a good, good news, right? You don't have to worry about it. Um, but we still need to know what's going on. We need to know that this stuff is real. And the world's going to just laugh at this. You're going to be like, oh, devils, you know. Well, I was laughing at that person when they, when that woman that was like saying, we shall always be, is calling herself Enigma, and he's saying, no, you're not a bad person. You're not a bad person. You don't want to do that. I'm laughing. I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, you're talking to a devil. <laughs> you know, you're talking to a devil saying, you're not a bad person. You know, I'm like, that devil's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, like, you'd imagine that the devil's probably like, you're an idiot. Stop talking to me like I'm a person. Like, I'm a human being. But... 
that's 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 what I, I think they're stupid. I think they're dumb to think that it's not demon devil possession, right? But in first John chapter four and verse one, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Or hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So that spirit of Antichrist is already here. Notice in verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you have the Holy Ghost inside of you, remember the Holy Ghost never leaves you, and will never leave you, nor forsake you. You have the Holy Ghost living inside of you, and your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Do you think that a devil can make its abode there? No. The Holy Ghost, if the devil try, I mean, the devil's not going to come close to getting in there. Okay, And so we, we don't believe you can be possessed with the devil if you're saved, but an unsaved person, you know, free game. And you know, a lot of these people that become reprobates, they were possessed with devils, and then the devil departed out of them, and then seven other devils, worse than, more, more, more wicked and worse than themselves, came in, and the last state of that man was worse than the first. So uh, it's not something to trifle with when it comes to uh, that type of stuff. Don't get into this Ouija board garbage. Don't invoke Satan. I mean, I know I'm, I shouldn't have to say that, but don't play around with this stuff. You may say, well, it's just innocent. It's just a game. I mean, it's just like some game that some company like manufactured. Listen, I don't care where it came from. You can make anything into worshiping the devil. And so uh, this stuff is real. I've, I've, I've seen it, like as far as seeing people that this has happened to, just out soul winning. And so it's still there. You know, this stuff still exists, and we need to be mindful of that. Don't be afraid of it, but you need to be cautious of it and cognizant of it. And the fact that, hey, if that happens, what do you do? Give them the Bible. And you can even tell the person, listen, you're possessed with a devil. The Lord rebuked that devil out of you, and here's some verses to go with that. Okay, what a lot of people say is the Lord rebuked thee, and then they don't say any verses. I mean, obviously that is in the Bible, right? That is, a, that is a, the word of God when you say the Lord rebuke thee. That's in the Bible. But just you know, immerse that person in the word of God. Just immerse them to where that, that devil just can't stand it anymore. They'll run away if, if, they, if the devil doesn't come out. Right? And so anyway, uh, that's what the Bible teaches about devil possession. I could go on for days about it because it's everywhere <laughs> in the New Testament. Okay, but let's end with a word of prayer today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, morning. I pray that you'd be with us as we go out soul winning, but also with uh, the fellowship. And Lord, just pray that you would uh, uh, bless the time that we have together. We pray that you would be glorified in everything that we do. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.